We take questions on uh, baseball, uh, arts, uh, history, literature. Not, not baseball. Not baseball. Okay, I'll take the baseball. You can have all the rest. Okay. All right. So first question for you, Dr. Jankovic. How can my children learn if they're at risk for Parkinson's disease? Um, even though I was talking a little bit about genetics of Parkinson's disease, I have to emphasize that only maybe six to 10% of patients with Parkinson's disease actually have a genetic form of Parkinson's disease. So if there's a strong family history um, and there are several members in your family that have Parkinson's disease, that obviously increases the suspicion that you might uh, fall into this uh, small group of patients with Parkinson that have genetic form of Parkinson. And you may talk to your uh, neurologist about uh, actually being tested for one of these uh, genes. The most common one is the LARC2 gene that I mentioned. There are a number of other genes that have been discovered. And these tests are now commercially available, uh, but they really should not be used indiscriminately in everybody. So if there's a strong family history uh, of Parkinson's disease and you have an early young onset of Parkinson, I think that might be of interest uh, to you to know whether you have a genetic form of Parkinson, and that would then also help you address the question what is the risk uh, that my children uh, will develop Parkinson's? So just give you, to give you an example, uh, if you have a LARC2 gene mutation, uh, your children have maybe 20 to 30% chance of uh, inheriting the same gene and developing Parkinson's disease. So um, you're gonna have to obviously think about it, have a family discussion about it. Uh, we don't test children uh, for these gene mutations. Uh, we test only adults. They have to be 18 years old or older. Uh, but there has to be a really, really good reason uh, for you to do these genetic testing because, because it has lots of implications for, you know, uh, not only for the prognosis, but for insurance and lots of other things. So uh, I would not take it lightly, uh, even though 23andMe, uh, uh, I think, offers these tests uh, fairly easily. Uh, so before you do any kind of genetic testing, make sure you understand why you're doing that and have a very detailed discussion with your neurologist about it uh, uh, before you actually order the test. Okay, next question. Uh, I understand there's a new vaccination that's been tested in Austria on Parkinson's disease uh, attacking alpha-synuclein. Can you tell us what your thoughts are on that? So th this was one of the uh, topics I was going to cover uh, uh, if I had a little bit more time, so I'm glad that uh, somebody asked that question. Um, so th there's a, a company called Aferis that's doing a, a study in Vienna uh, in patients uh, with Parkinson's disease and another condition called multiple system atrophy, uh, where immunologically the, the, uh, there's an attempt to decrease uh, the alpha synuclein. We're doing a study currently with a company called Prothena, uh, where we're using uh, uh, antibody against alpha synuclein. We infuse these patients uh, with this antibody in an attempt to reduce uh, alpha synuclein. So this uh, study uh, already uh, had a preliminary result, which was uh, uh, published in, in a press release uh, about a month ago, uh, where uh, the company uh, reported that patients who were treated with uh, this uh, uh, proteina drug, the uh, monoclonal antibody, had a significant reduction, like 90% reduction in alpha synuclein in their blood, but that does not necessarily mean that uh, the alpha synuclein in the brain was also reduced. So uh, I hope you'll invite me back in a couple of years and I can give the results of our study uh, to see what, what's happening with those patients. So th there are a lot of people that think that Parkinson is linked to inflammation and this uh, may be addressed by changing your diet. Do you make any suggestions to your patients about changing their, their diet and how that might affect their Parkinson? So this is, uh, again, one of the most frequently asked questions, what about my diet? Uh, I'll give you a very simple answer. Uh, there is absolutely no need to, for you to change your diet except if you have these motor fluctuations, uh, your neurologist may tell you that you should keep your protein intake low with breakfast and lunch um, in order to, to prevent the competition between the protein and L-DOPA. 
but otherwise there is no specific diet for Parkinson patients despite what you think about it, read about um, and this is a very frequently asked question there's no need for vitamins uh, natural uh, uh, um, uh, supplements um, there are billions and billions of dollars spent on all these uh, vitamins and they do absolutely nothing for patients with Parkinson's disease. Many of them have been tested um, uh, in our clinic and other clinics. Uh, there's no evidence that vitamin E, for example, or vitamin D, or any of these vitamins uh, do anything for Parkinson. Dr. Jankovic, I understand that Parkinson's affects the eye muscles. Can you uh, briefly tell us what are the common effects on the eyes that you see in patients in your clinic? So there are many ophthalmological features of Parkinson's disease. Uh, again, we don't have time to discuss it, but the most common one is uh, what's referred to as convergence insufficiency. So if I read a newspaper, my eyes come in like this, they converge. Uh, in patients with Parkinson's disease, they don't, they don't converge. Uh, so patients uh, with Parkinson, they often say they have trouble reading paper. Um, I often tell them, well, cover one eye or get an eye patch and you can actually read better. So Parkinson patients can actually read better with one eye than with both eyes. Uh, that is the most common ophthalmologic feature of Parkinson. But there are many, many others. And if you have problems with your vision, you really need to see an ophthalmologist because just because you have Parkinson and you have trouble with your vision, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, uh, the visual problem has anything to do with Parkinson. Dr. Jankovic, we understand that you have one of the largest clinics in the country of Tourette syndrome as well as Parkinson. How often do you simultaneously see Parkinson and Tourette? Uh, well, yeah, one of my uh, areas of interest besides Parkinson is Tourette syndrome. Uh, Tourette syndrome is a very common uh, neurologic disease, usually starting in, in childhood, but may persist in adulthood, uh, manifested by tics. Uh, blinking, facial grimacing, shoulder shrugging, uh, sniffing, throating, grunting, these are the, the motor tics. Um, there is no evidence that Tourette syndrome, which is manifested by these tics, and Parkinson's disease are related. Both of them are relatively common, so it's not unusual for patients or families to have both conditions, but there's no direct relationship between Tourette and Parkinson. One of my friends started the Nupro patch for Parkinson disease and told me he almost died because of blood crystallization. Can you comment, is this real or is this myth? I think what uh, the question is probably referring to is uh, a report uh, about a few years ago, uh, three or four years ago, when Nupro was manufactured in a certain plant and was found to crystallize. Uh, and as a result, uh, uh, the manufacturing had to be changed, uh, and there, there was a two or three year period where we did not have uh, Nupro. But it has to do with the crystallization of the uh, medication in the patch, not in the blood. It has, uh, Nupro does not crystallize its blood. The new extended release of Parkinson medication, Ritari. Uh, I've been reading on the internet about many uh, stories of switching over to this medication with complex Parkinson disease where you have to take many frequent dosages every few hours and the switch over is a disaster. What sorts of uh, experience do you have in your clinic? Um, it, it's a challenge, uh, no question about it. Um, uh, Ritari is a useful medication, patients with motor fluctuations, um, but the switch from Cinemet, uh, Carpidopa levodopa, to Ritari can be very complicated. And you really need to work with your neurologist who is experienced in uh, this switch from uh, Cinemet to Ritari because even, even uh, neurologists generally don't know how to make that switch and I, I'm not going to go through this uh, mechanism how it's done but uh, make sure that your neurologist is experienced in using Ritari and switching you from Cinemet to Ritari. Are there any studies of high dose steroids as a treatment for Parkinson's? There probably are, but they are most likely going to be negative. There's no evidence that steroids uh, do anything for patients with Parkinson's disease. Okay. And last question from this morning. How much collaboration is there between the U.S., Europe, 
Australia, and Asia with uh, reference to Parkinson research and funding? Well, I, I always believe in collaboration, but um, um, it, it's challenging, challenging, challenging to have all these uh, various geographic areas uh, uh, represented in a collaborative global uh, uh, effort. Um, uh, certainly in the United States, uh, there are many groups like the Parkinson Study Group uh, and a number of other groups that uh, work together uh, for common uh, cause and, and design clinical trials that eventually help uh, patients with Parkinson's disease. Most of uh, the new discoveries uh, in terms of new drugs and new treatments are really driven not by uh, academic institutions, but by industry. Uh, the drug companies uh, develop the drug and then they try to get together uh, um, um, uh, academic or uh, private practice uh, neurologists to collaborate uh, in developing the, the, these uh, uh, trials and, and, and drugs. But there's very little collaboration, unfortunately, uh, between the continents. And my question for you, Dr. Jenkovic, after doing this for 30 plus years, can you tell the group your level of enthusiasm about the, the, the new generation of developments coming from Parkinson? What's your enthusiasm? Well, I'm by nature a very optimistic person, so uh, obviously I'm biased. I think that, uh, uh, that uh, the future for Parkinson patients is very bright. Um, we are beginning to understand for the first time what the mechanism of uh, neurodegeneration is in Parkinson's disease. We talked about alpha-synuclein, but there are many other uh, mechanisms that are currently being studied, and I'm quite sure that uh, eventually we're gonna learn how to uh, alter this uh, mechanism that results in cell death. Uh, we talked about uh, cutting down on alpha-synuclein as a one strategy, uh, but there are many, many other strategies that are being developed. Uh, we haven't even talked about surgery uh, for Parkinson's disease, something that Dr. Oaken and Dr. Uh, uh, Foote are interested in. Um, there are many new developments in surgical treatment of Parkinson's disease. So overall, I'm very, very optimistic. Uh, I think that uh, bright for patients with uh, the light, there is light at the end of the tunnel for patients with Parkinson's disease. I think the, the future is very bright. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for coming. Let's put our hands together. Thank you. That was just terrific. That was amazing. Thank you. Thanks, Joe.